Welcome to Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town from the world's number one poker community. Hey everybody, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski. Thank you so much for joining us on episode number 120 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest is less well-known at the felt, but rather well-known in the poker world for his work behind the scenes. Over the past few years, the Poker Go studio and the Aria Casino Resort Poker Room in Las Vegas have continuously been spoken about as among one of the best poker rooms in the world. It's no surprise to anyone when they go there. Of course, the experience is magical for players of all levels and all formats, and that's due in no small part to Aria's Director of Poker Operations, Ryan Kirk, on today's show. We're going to get to know him better. Ryan, welcome to the Cards Chat Podcast. Hey, Robbie. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I understand this is your first ever poker podcast appearance, so I'm delighted to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. This is uh, quite the experience for me uh, as well. That's cool. Uh, Before we went on air, this is something I did not know. You said that you had a degree, I believe, in biblical studies. (laughs) <laughs> How does one get a degree in biblical studies and end up in the poker industry? Can you let us know how that happened? That's a uh, that's a great question. It's actually a question I ask myself all the time. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> you know, when I was uh, going to college, uh, was able to get into a, a great college. Loved my experience there. Uh, started on the path of a, a religious uh, studies degree. Um, Kind of by my third year there, I had realized that I was probably going to be looking elsewhere for a career, uh, but I did want to wrap up my my studies so that I didn't have to start a brand new major. Uh, And I'm really thankful that I did. I had a great experience um, at college. uh, And then actually, before we even get to the poker part, I took that degree and then worked in politics for several years. Really? uh, Opportunity to be an intern um, in Washington D.C. for a con- for my congressman at the time, and then um, after that worked in some local politics back up in Washington State, both running campaigns as well as working in the state legislature there for a while. Uh, and the thing that I like to always say about politics is that it's a lot of work for not a lot of pay. And I was very thankful to discover poker dealing in my mid twenties, which was uh, not a lot of work but a lot of pay. Right. <laughs> Of course, due respect to poker dealers, you know, plenty definitely working very hard. They can come after me all they want. They know. They do it. It's great work. I'm not out there digging ditches. Um, You know, my back might hurt a little bit here and there, but Uh uh, but yeah, poker dealing is a great profession. So you said you discovered it. Where, when, and how did you discover it? So uh, I, like many people my age, am a uh, boomer baby. You know, uh, Chris Moneymaker, watching it on ESPN, um, getting the getting into it with the WSOP, WPT, all of the various uh, TV shows that were on at the time. And I remember uh, my first opportunity to set foot in a casino um, was I think I was uh, 24 after having watched a commercial on a WPT uh, telecast for a local, you know, went in there and played two four limit hold'em. And uh, and knew that I was hooked. I played a ton online, uh, so it was really uh, back in the eight 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 and Paradise Poker and sure. Pacific Poker and all of the the well for me what were the early days, and then right. obviously on Party and and Full Tilt and Poker Stars and whatnot. But um, no, definitely a boomer baby in the uh, in my early twenties. Found poker. Fortunately, didn't find it when I was in college, so I was able to finish college. Right. I know that the story for a lot of poker players is that they just found it in college and then college kind of went to the uh to the back burner but i'm thankful that i was able to finish uh my studies and then found poker later so um i did get to play for a living for a few years back in the limit hold'em days uh did that and then um got into poker dealing when i was about 26. and you said a local room this is i think you said indiana is where you were from no no no, washington state Oh, Washington is the, okay, cool. So it's so, an interesting uh, poker room, poker scene up there. There's a lot of uh, uh, Native American card rooms, I believe. So that's where I got my first dealing job was yeah. uh, Mapachute uh, Tribe, uh, working in the poker room there. That's where I had played 
uh, a lot of poker prior to getting a job. Um, unfortunately, they don't have a poker room anymore. They have a lot of mini card rooms uh, around the Washington State area. Um, and the tribal casinos don't have poker, to my knowledge, in the Puget Sound area up there anymore. But um, that's where uh, that's where all the poker. We had a 34 table room when I worked there. Uh, probably the busiest room and a lot of limit hold them. Everything up there, even to this day, is still a lot of limit, um, which is different for me having come to Vegas, where there's very few options to play limit in comparison to no limit. And then obviously pot limit Omaha. Sure. Sure. So, you know, the, the whole move to Vegas thing, I'm wondering if this was, you said you played poker for a living. Did you go there with the, uh, you know, Mike McDermott dream of thinking you're going to make it as a professional player or did a particular industry dealing opportunity come up that said, okay, it's time to, to move away from home and go to Vegas? No, it's funny. You know, uh, uh, Buddy and I were living together at the time and, and he had kind of just said, hey, I think I'm going to go to Vegas. And I didn't really have anything else to do at that point. And I had left my dealing job. Uh, it was just plain as well. So I said, yeah, let's just go. Um, it's funny. We had traveled to Vegas uh, several times a year, years before that. And every single time I got on that plane to leave Vegas, I was so happy I didn't live here. Uh, I was just thinking how happy I was to be going back home. Man, I don't think I could ever live there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, here we go. 12 years later, uh, I've lived here now for 12 years and uh, couldn't imagine uh, living anywhere else. This has been great. Uh, you don't realize 30 years in the gloomy, dark, rainy weather of Seattle, Washington, uh, how much your body really craves the sun. Uh -huh. And so now just having the ability to wake up and, and see uh, a glowing ball of fire up in the sky every single day is uh, is pretty nice. That's pretty fantastic. So uh, you sort of stumbled into Aria one day and said, hey, y'all uh, got an open position or how did that come about specifically? Uh, you know, 12 years in Vegas, I think you've been at Aria for all of them or 11 of them? 11 of them, actually. Yeah. Um, so I couldn't get a job right away at ARIA. They had uh, a requirement that you needed to have a year of experience at another uh, luxury resort and casino on the strip, which I just didn't have yet. So I went and got a job at another uh, strip casino. And then a year later was able to get the, the uh, dealing job here. Started out uh -huh. as a dealer. Nice. And were, at, did, were you continuing to play sort of on the side at the time or were you focused at that point of like, I want to make my career, you know, with the blazer on or, you know, or dealing? <laughs> Definitely was still playing at the time, trying to uh, to make that work. Um, but once I got the job here at Aria, uh, I was kind of warned by some of the people who had um, helped me get into Aria that it was a... Um, it's one of those dealing jobs where they actually require you to deal. Uh, it wasn't going to be one of those jobs where you showed up and got on the playlist every day and were able right. to get out and play <laughs> over, but not like you were going to be asked to deal. And that was the truth. Um, it was definitely a job that I just jumped uh, headfirst into and was, uh, you know, doing a, a minimum of 40 hours a week right away. Wow. My goodness. Well, I mean, you and I had a chance to see each other recently at my uh, Card Player Lifestyle Mixed Game <laughs> Festival along with a number of your ARIA uh, poker colleagues. You mentioned up in Washington State, you're playing Limit Hold'em. Obviously, as a dealer, you have to know how to deal all the games. When did mixed games come uh, into your life, right? So that was actually something that I got involved in, got excited about while I was still living up in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, we did have games up there, but every time that I came to uh, Vegas, um, I was looking for mixed games and got to know some of the mixed game players, got into different text threads, um, <clears throat> looking for like the 15, 30, 20, 40 mixed games. Um, you know, strange as it was, as great of a player that I thought that I was, I was always getting consistent invites to the games every single time that I showed up into Vegas. So that probably tells you something about how good of a player <laughs> I actually was in comparison to how good I thought I was. Um, but, uh, no, I, I, uh, I craved it. I mean, you, you come to Vegas and you think, man, I'm going to play no limit. I'm going to make money. I'm going to scratch out some, some money and make it a profitable trip. And, um, I was definitely more interested in the learning of, uh, the mixed games. Now, back then the, the crazy mixed games that we would play were like Badoogie and <laughs> Daisy. Daisy was like, Whoa, what's going on? You know? 
<laughs> and now these games are, they're really something. They, they, they are only uh, limited by the imagination of the mixed game players, of which I am one. So There you go. Do you have a, a favorite among them or perhaps a least favorite? So I always used to say that Stud Eight or Better was my favorite game that I'm terrible at. But it, it still <laughs> is. I mean, I love playing just Stud Eight or Better. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm old at this point. I guess I'm probably like a hundred in poker years because I like playing the, the, the more traditional mixed games like uh -huh. the and ace to five and deuce to seven and, and the stud games and I'll play Raz, you know, I'll deuce to seven Raz and whatnot. Um, I haven't, uh, been able to get into the drama haws as much as I know that they are. Um, a big thing right now and all of the different variations. I've written rules for all of them. I've played a few of them in some of the mixed games, but um, yeah, that definitely is, I guess I'm, I'm speaking more like Gen X when this is where the millennials and Gen Z are talking about poker now. Hey, you're speaking to a fellow Gen X or mixed game lover who will also play any mixed game, but I do happen to enjoy the traditional mix myself. <laughs> um as one climbs up the corporate ladder, you know, moving from dealing to flooring to, you know, the dual rates and shift manager, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, and you put more of a focus and emphasis on your career and, and, you know, moving up that whole ladder, sometimes the the play tends to sort of fall by the wayside. Have you managed to keep up your play in cash games or tournaments at all, or has that sort of just become less important to you? And more focused on, you know, really, you know, continuing to make the name for yourself. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's um, probably if you ask any industry person, uh, and I always say this to all of our, our new hires and new people coming into the department, um, you know, we all got in. You don't just stumble into poker. You get into poker because you enjoy playing poker. No one comes in off the street and is like, I've never heard of this game before in my life, but I'm going to make a career of it. It's just not a thing that happens in our world. And so definitely... Um, I don't want to say that my passion for playing has waned, but it has changed mm -hmm. uh, as I focused more and more on the operational side of the industry. Um, <clears throat> that's where I have devoted uh, my time and efforts. And so I, you know, I played poker at a time when a GTO was like, what is that? Like a type of a car or something like that, as opposed to a way that you're supposed to be playing poker. Yeah. And, um, you know, read all of Sklansky's books back in the day, which I'm sure people would laugh at me now as though this was my, oh, God, you can't, um, uh, you can't only have just read those. You've got to read all of these, you know, new, new things about poker and what podcast you listen to and what training sites have you gone to and all of that. So sure. I, I love to keep up with the industry and I love to see where the industry as a whole is going. Um, but as far as the playing side, it's definitely become more recreational for me now. I don't, uh, I don't, uh, leave my, the, the workplace every day like I used to and drive down the street and sit down and start grinding for four to six hours at, uh, <laughs> one of the other, uh, local, uh, card rooms here. I, I definitely enjoy my time away from the card room and all of the card, all of the time that I want, that I spend in card rooms for the most point is going to be here at ARIA. Well, I will ask you, so away from the card room, what do you do to relax and enjoy life, decompress a little bit when it's not poker? Uh, I mean, I love to sleep, but as I've gotten older, <laughs> it becomes harder and harder to do. I don't know. This is a, this is a terrible turn for my life, uh, that it's becoming more and more difficult to stay in bed. But uh no, I mean, I enjoy eating, that's for sure. I definitely have put on some weight over the last several years, uh, getting out and hanging out with friends and, and having dinners and lunches where I can. I love to golf. I'm not very good at it, but I do enjoy golfing. Um, and pickleball. I love playing oh, pickleball. Nice. So, nice. Well, uh, I don't know if pickleball's hit that side of the world yet or not, but it is the <laughs> fastest growing sport in the U.S., um, there's major league pickleball now and all sorts of, uh, avenues for people to get involved with pickleball. I sound like a pickleball ambassador right now, but there is a lot of crossover between the poker industry here in Vegas and pickleball. So, uh, I definitely am one of those people. Excellent. Very cool. Favorite spot to eat in Aria. We'll put you on the spot there. Oh man, you got to go with Javier's. 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 Just the best. I mean, Solid pick. 
Sounds like very cool. Uh, well, we were looking at your Hendon Mob results, right? Obviously, you're much more of a catch game player, uh, which I totally understand. But you have a, a notable, <laughs> you have a notable tournament cash there. What single cash in the five hundred dollar casino employees event will you be playing it this year? Um, you know the 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 problem is. That's one of the only tournaments that I've ever entered. So it's like, like in the, in live, like, so I don't want to ruin my average. I mean, my ROI at this point is so high that if I were to enter a tournament and not cash, it would be catastrophic to the, to the average there. So, um, I don't know. You maybe we'll see. I would love to play in, in more tournaments, um, it's such a commitment. Yeah, <laughs> These tournament players. I hear you. I mean, this is you're just signing up for a twelve to, to fourteen hour day sometimes. Yep. Um, but yes, I'm glad you did find my one cash. I'm very proud of that. Um, <laughs> I think the buy-in on that was like five hundred dollars, so yep. I profited what like ninety-seven dollars or something yep. along those lines. I think actually way back then too that you start it was a five hundred dollar tournament and you started with five hundred and chips. Okay. So I mean <laughs> I ran that stack up. Blinds were probably twenty five fifty. Who knows? I mean just <laughs> the five hundred stack. Well, lest you think that I'm making too much fun of you, I do not have a hand in mob profile, but very much <laughs> for the same. I mean, well, I have two reasons, two big reasons. One is that same thing. It's a big commitment. And when you've got other stuff going on, like cash games, you know, it's good. You want to be able to get up when you can. If you got to go and interview somebody or, you know, family's call and something like that. And obviously I live here in Israel. We don't exactly have <laughs> poker rooms right down uh, the street. So a nice humble brag about having a hand in mob profile. Good for you, Ryan. I love now, it. If you, if you looked me up on, uh, golly, official poker rankings, that uh -huh. was the thing back in the day. Uh, so if you look me up OPR with all of my sit and goes and all of my online tournaments and stuff, good. I had good ROI, I had good numbers back then. I, you know, put in a lot, a decent amount of volume, but, uh, um, I don't even know if those sites are around anymore. Again, right, right. This is the multiple decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Well, we'll shift uh, more on to the industry side. Obviously, that's where your your work and efforts have been concentrated. You've worked in the area area for eleven years, uh, and it took you a decade to become the director of poker operations. Our good uh, mutual friend Sean McCormick, who was episode number two right here on the Cards Chat podcast. Uh, had held that position as the poker boss for a while. He's moved up, uh, making room for yourself. Um, with all of your experience there on property, there are, I mean, just a plethora of poker rooms, as you said, just down the street, across town. I mean, Las Vegas really is the mecca. What is, in your opinion, or are the unique selling points, the, the things that make playing at Aria's poker room special? Uh, again, great question. Um, it's, and it's something, it's one of those questions that I actually kind of ask myself on a frequent basis so that I'm reminded hmm. of what makes this room special and, and unique. It, it genuinely is <coughs> a, uh, a bucket list item for a lot of players was for me, even when I was, uh, not living here. Um, people come from all over the world, uh, to come and see this room. They've seen that it has a global footprint, um, center strip next to the Bellagio, Poker Go Studio attached to it, gold card walls, gold drapes, yeah. table one room, formerly the Ivy Room, um, the games that are played here. It really is a special experience. And that's um, something that I kind of remain in awe of uh, and, and encourage our staff around here to remain in awe of themselves that we get this awesome opportunity to work in a poker room like this. Um, there just isn't anything like it in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you get to come to work every day. You get to, uh, work in a luxurious, uh, resort and casino setting, um, the investment from the company that we work for in poker and in this room, um, the things that we're doing here and the things that we're trying to accomplish, um, it really encourages you to keep on going day in, day out um, and put out a great product for our players. Um, and most importantly for me, making sure that our team members here at ARIA love coming to work every single day. 
Uh, within the company, you know, not trying to get too corporate here, but within the company, we talk about putting on the show. And that genuinely is what we do here. We are in the poker business, but we are in the entertainment industry. And so it really is a reminder to all of us that people show up here to play poker, and that's the avenue that we have for guest service. Um, but we are, in a sense, putting on a show day in, day out for people to come and be entertained here at ARIA. Um, and we have a responsibility to our guests to make sure that we're living up to their expectation when they show up. Excellent. It's a beautiful answer. And again, I've played numerous <clears throat> times at ARIA, and I can certainly say that I've experienced that that specialness uh, that you described. And, and I will say also, uh, with ARIA, there was also one other poker room in the MGM family with the Bellagio. The first time that I played in both of those rooms, I, you know, I actually avoided. it. You're going to laugh at this one. I avoided playing in either of those rooms for a very long time, thinking to myself, oh, man, only the, the sharks, only the big boys play in, you know, in Aria and Bellagio. And uh, another good uh, mutual friend of ours, uh, Elie Lezra, he told me, he's like, Robby, one three is one three. You know, so <laughs> it doesn't matter where you are. And the beauty of it, and the reason I'm bringing that up is, you know, folks out there, if you've ever had that sort of hesitation and you say, OK, you know, because of the tremendous reputation that rooms like Aria have, like you're afraid to set foot. I assure you, one three is one three and you get all of the wonderful packaging uh, and service and entertainment that Ryan uh, described. So, uh, you know, I, I really like the way uh, you described it there. Uh, you mentioned, Ryan, of course, the, the Poker Go studio just a few hundred yards away walking from the Aria Poker Room. Uh, folks, if you've ever watched Poker Go events, the cash games, you notice that they use Aria chips uh, in there for all of the events. It's kind of a, a match made in heaven, both for the players as well as for, for us, the fans. I'm kind of wondering, you know, I don't even necessarily know completely myself. Could you sort of describe the relationship between Poker Go and the studio and Aria and the personnel? How does that work? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, it's funny. I was talking to uh, uh, some members of some management team at other card rooms and they were kind of asking me the same thing here locally. Like, hey, we know you've got the studio. How does that even work? Uh -huh. um, and so uh, we're the ones with the gaming license. So Aria still has the gaming license, Poker Go, Poker Central. They do not have their own gaming license. Mm -hmm. um, and so that requires them to use our staff. You know, they are their own separate entity. There is, um, uh, a, you know, basically a contract that we have with them, uh, different stipulations on what we do and don't do and whatnot. But essentially, it's this great partnership. It's a great opportunity for uh, them to continue to bring um, really high value streamed events, uh, the PGT series, um, <clears throat> high stakes poker, uh, no gamble, no future, high stakes duel, all of the great shows that they put on. And then we get the opportunity here at ARIA to be uh, partners with them when it comes to providing staffing and support, uh, not just with uh, Paul Campbell and, and our, uh, you know, being our studio manager, our tournament director over there, uh, but all of our dealers, our game attendants, our supervisors, our cage, our security, our bartenders, cocktail servers, all of our staff get the opportunity to go over there and help facilitate um, the events that we have uh, that Poker Go puts on with our support staff. So it is, uh, again, just this great partnership uh, that we look forward to uh, continuing for many years to come. Cool. Uh, I'm wondering when you have things going on simultaneously, any of the events or shows that you had mentioned, and of course, you know, the Aria Poker Room itself <laughs> is running 24 7. Are there any sometimes perhaps challenging logistics uh, that come up that you that you find yourself having to manage? Sure. I mean, here at Aria, we are a 24 table room. Uh, but when we flex out to uh, encompass all of the various studio events, we turn on turn into a 33 table room if they have their nine table footprint or even in this last PLO series, we were able to cram in 14 additional tables over there. So, um, you know, when we have uh, when we have staffing for a 24 table room that needs to accommodate the flex out to a 38 table room. Sure, there is some logistical uh -huh. uh, challenges 
challenges that get presented that way. But um, <laughs> our staff loves it. They love. They look forward to the events that we have over there. Um, Poker Go has uh, an aggressive uh, series um, that they put on with the Poker Go Tour. Uh, so tournament wise, and all of the, the various series that that Tim Duckworth and and the PGT puts on over there, as well as the cash game side with Brent sure. Hanks. And Jeff and those guys putting together these lineups for uh, for a lot of the the great uh, streaming live either live streaming or prepackaged shows that they put together um, from the cash game side. Sure, very cool. And so, where like you, you know, we said uh, you're not always necessarily in front of the cameras; you're behind the scenes. What's Ryan Kirk doing when all of that is going on? And you know, you mentioned all of the the moving parts. So, what is your role uh, in that regard? So um, typically when those events are going on, Ryan Kirk goes over there and fanboys just as much as everyone else does. I mean, I, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> probably bother Paul and the tournament staff and, and, uh, and those guys with Poker Go um, just hanging around and watching the, uh, how the operations work over there, being available. Um, the great thing about being the director is, you know, I don't have to punch in and punch out at a certain time. I get sure. to kind of come and go as I please. Anything that comes up in the moment, you know, I can I can be available to deal with. Um, but then there is also the opportunity to do a lot of the fun things. And that's one of the perks. I mean, just being able to go over there when we're running those series, uh, when we're doing some of the, the taping for shows and uh, getting a, a behind the scenes look at, uh, at what they're doing over there. Um, and like I said, just being a fan. I mean, sure. it's uh, really is an awesome opportunity to get to see uh, those guys at work. Sure. And I do believe, you know, just for those who don't know, anyone could, I mean, it is an open public place. When the events are going, you are allowed to go there and rail just like any other poker room. Obviously you can't interrupt, you know, broadcast, you have to be quiet and all that other sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, for those not in the know, when, when taping is going, I do believe, uh, perhaps with a couple of exceptions, you are allowed to go and fanboy. So, um, you meant, you mentioned, um, you know, a lot, a lot of their series, you have obviously the high stakes poker, no gamble, no future, the U S poker open, uh, that just concluded. They had, uh, re the two new additions, the mixed game series. They had the, uh, PLO series. Is there sort of um, a favorite that you have among them, either as a fan or that presents some cool, interesting opportunities that you particularly uh, enjoy on the you know logistics and, and industry side of things? Um, well, I'm really proud of the work that uh, the PGT uh, has done in responding to player feedback i mean i'm excited for them and and what tim and donnie and those guys have done to um to put together the mixed game series that was yeah. in result of feedback from the players tim did a ton of legwork over there to gauge the interest and the players showed out i mean it was a fantastic um turnout by the players uh our staff got a ton of kudos uh, not only from the players, but from, uh, you know, on all the socials and the work that they did. Sure. I know the biggest complaint is that the, you know, the series wasn't streamed. Um, and as a mixed game player myself, you know, I, I would love for all of these things to be streamed. There's just a lot of things that go on behind the scenes on, sure. on those decisions. Um, and then, uh, and then I'm really excited about the PLO series that we just pulled off too. That was something that Paul, uh, Campbell here at Aria had been uh, pushing for for a long time, uh, knowing the the level of interest that players had for a PLO specific series, and him and Tim worked together to um, to build that schedule out and uh, and provide that um, offering to all of the players. And again, they showed out, showed out, showed out. It was a great uh, um, event series over there. And I know that uh, we're looking forward to doing all of that stuff again. I mean, obviously, there's the pillars that PGT has with the Poker Go Cup and the U.S. Poker Open and the Poker Masters yeah. and then culminating with the PGT Championship um, and, of course, the Super High Roller Bowl. So they've got their their majors. Yeah. Um, 
So they keep us busy throughout the year. You know, they have a, a very aggressive uh, schedule and, uh, and we're just excited to, to be the ones who get to work alongside them uh, in, in making these events a huge success. For sure. And, you know, we, we asked uh, before of like, what is it that makes Aria unique from a player experience? You know, we've tackled that, but certainly as far as jobs like yours in poker rooms in Las Vegas or anywhere else, that whole aspect of the Poker Go studio certainly adds a lot of very unique, interesting uh, items to the day-to-day, week-to-week uh, schedule. So thanks for uh, kind of cluing us in behind the scenes as to, as to what goes on there. That's pretty cool. Um, you mentioned Table One, formerly known as Ivy's Room, uh, where all the big nosebleed stakes, cash games are held. Obviously, uh, Phil has played in there numerous times, continues to play from time to time. Of course, uh, that is a room where privacy is uh, obviously respected uh, to the highest level. With that said, whether you can or cannot reveal any particular names, are there any, I don't know, celebrities of note or any particular matches or or sightings that kind of like what you would call highlights of I got to be there and and see that? And then it's a little difficult because we want to respect the privacy, but some amazing stories surely come out of that room. You know, um, you're obviously right on the mark when you say we want to respect the privacy. And that's uh, something that I highly value and, and not going into all of the variety of people that have shown up um, here on property or in the poker room. Uh, you know, I'd hate to to mention people like Ellen DeGeneres or Channing Tatum or, you know, any of these types of, um, you know, Michael Phelps and and uh, people that have shown up here in the in the ARIA poker room over the right. years you, to respect their privacy. Of I would want to put their business out there. Um, and so, look, it, it's one of those things working in this poker room that uh you kind of just have to show up as a player, or as an employee, and you never know who's going to be here from day to day. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a sports guy, so I love the fact that Oral Hershiser used to be a regular player here. Um, you know, you could go on and on about sure. the people who come in and play here in the room. And so uh, it is an experience. You never know who you're going to see playing in a one, three game, playing in a one, two PLO, two, five, no limit. When any of our core games you look over and see someone up there playing in a hundred, 200, no limit game. And, and I've seen, I've listened to you rap before. Or I've seen <laughs> NBA basketball before or uh, any of those things. So yeah, yeah. it's uh it really is an exciting place to work and you just never know who you're going to see from, uh, from time to time. That's cool. It must be a struggle. I can hear obviously, you know, a fanboy just like myself. I mean, we all have fans, uh, you know, we're, we're fans of different people's work, celebrities, uh, sports stars, that sort of thing. I can say also just recently <clears throat> I was at, uh, you know, a different property and I noticed that Bill Murray was there. So, or I just saw him and I was like, I ran over like any fan would and you want to go and try to get a selfie or an autograph, something. When you're wearing the suit though, you have to be professional. Have there been moments where, you know, when they step away from the table, are you allowed, can you kind of let that fanboy show and they would be kind enough to sort of sign, you know, your, your book or I don't know, take a picture with you. Is that, has that happened? Um, if I get a book, I would love to have them sign it for me. No, <laughs> um, you know, I'll, uh, with being as vague as possible, I, I really do try to, to keep all of that stuff under wraps. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have had an opportunity, uh, big super mega stars, uh, at times who are looking for, um, you know, maybe a private place to just go smoke a cigarette mm-hmm. and, uh, showing them to a private area and then having just a, a very surreal experience with mm-hmm. like a five to 10 minute conversation with uh, just someone who, if I said the name, you just right. be like, wow. And, and here I am just this little director of the Aria poker room, <laughs> getting the opportunity to uh, uh, just have a, a regular conversation with, right. uh, with, you know, these people. And so just because they want to go out, smoke a cigarette, chit right. chat away the table really quick ask me about the game they're playing whatever you know sure um, this is uh, a really exciting uh place to work 
That's cool. And I imagine that I met my fair share of celebrities and, you know, and, and well-known folks in my day as well. I think, you know, the, the universal factor among it is at the end of the day, they put their pants on the same way we do, you know? Sure. I mean? So yeah, that, that's both legs at once, just like you and I do. Right. <laughs> Indeed. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Um, well, so many of us know or are familiar with the Las Vegas poker scene during peak times of year, like the summer, what are Aria's or any poker room for that matter? What are the biggest challenges you face during the poker off season and how do you try to meet them? Yeah. I mean, you bring up a good point. Uh, the, the eyes of the poker world are always on uh, Las Vegas during yeah. uh, June and July. And then uh, there's some other major events now that, uh, that come around different parts of the year, but um, but we're here 24-7, 365 a year. So yeah. when everyone uh, leaves town, we still have um, <clears throat> we still have a poker room to run here. So I think the biggest thing is knowing the, the ramp up for the busy times and ensuring that our staff here don't get burned out, mm -hmm. um, making sure that uh, that they're taking time away from uh, from work to uh, rest and relax and recharge. Um, get that healthy work-life balance. Um, and then also the, the in-between times are great opportunities for us to focus in uh, with our staff on development, career development, career growth, um, you know, building into the next uh, generation of leaders. Uh, I was very fortunate in my own um, journey here to, uh, to have people that took the time to invest in me. Uh, and, and I would give them a, a ton of credit for uh, me being in the position that I'm in now. And so wanting to make sure that we pay that forward, it's very uh, important for uh, the company as well, that we do invest in the talent that we've already, um, uh, that we've got here and that we've already shown an interest in and making sure that they have the tools necessary to succeed in their own career growth. And so that's a constant, uh, constant thing that we're working on all the time. and and. To be honest, that's the that's more of the norm, the, the investment that we're doing, not only for our team members, but then also for the player experience, making sure that we're being receptive to feedback. We do have regulars, even though it's Vegas, it's not 100 percent tours just flying in every day. Right. We have a, a very big uh, base of regulars that drive by a whole ton of other card rooms on their way in from Summerlin or Henderson. Uh, <clears throat> North Vegas, wherever they may be coming from, uh, to play in our room every day, and so we want to make sure that we're being receptive and responsive to their feedback. So that's the that's the the more consistent work. The other ten months out of the year, and then the right. two months for us is really the anomaly. Whereas I think for the vast majority of people coming here to Vegas, that two months is their norm. That's just right. what they know Vegas poker to be is during that uh, those two summer months in the WSOP time. For sure. So I will ask then, so during the WSOP, obviously you said there's, you know, preparations that you do in the ramp up to it. You know, obviously it's peak poker season. You go anywhere in the city, you know, there's plenty of poker being played. And of course, every poker room would love their slice of the pie. What sort of uh, accommodate, I mean, you mentioned like, for example, when you've got like poker go stuff, you know, you add more tables. What sort of stuff does Aria do to make sure you're putting your Again, 24-7, 365, but in particular during the summer, your best feet forward uh, for the players to come in and enjoy themselves. Yeah, absolutely. We um, So for the last decade, we've been running our Aria Poker Classic. So we uh, expand our footprint out to the front of the poker room, um, clearing out some of our slots and putting in poker tables, um, making sure that we have enough space out there and enough tables to be able to run a, a quality tournament series. Uh, we really find our niche when it comes to one day, uh, one day events. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of synergy amongst all of the properties and the offerings, uh, competitors and whatnot. WSOP kind of is always the first domino to fall every year. And then uh, some of the other uh, card rooms uh, start to drop their schedules. And, and as we go further and further, we know kind of what we are and what we're trying to be when it comes to what we're offering for tournaments. And our player base for tournaments during the summer are people who 
aren't looking to have their chips stay in a bag overnight. They're looking for a one day tournament. Maybe they've bagged in another event and they don't have their day two until a couple days later. We right. give them that opportunity in the interim to go and play a really a high quality tournament. Paul Campbell is one of the best at coming up with these structures, making sure that people are getting the best bang for their buck um, <clears throat> value for, uh, for the, for the buy-in that they're getting uh, structures uh, give a lot of play at the end of the tournament, which is what people are looking for. Um, and then having really good uh, guarantees on the tournament so that for a one day tournament uh, people know that they're getting great value out of it. So uh, on top of that, during the summer, we are the place where you're going to want to come and play PLO. You know, everyone else is going to be spreading some PLO, but all of the PLO, um, for the most part, happens here at ARIA. Uh, starting at 1-2 PLO, 5-5 five, five PLO with a rock. We've got our quarter, 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 50, 50, 100. I mean, they just during the summer, all of the, the levels of uh, PLO ramp up. And that's something that we are... Um, really thankful uh, that we've invested in over the years, the, uh, the PLO crowd and, and seeing that it's, as it's grown and grown, we've been able to grow alongside it. We have a 24 table room and a lot of times a third of the games that we're spreading are PLO. Um, and so that's a really big footprint for, for us and our 24 table room to be having six, seven, eight games of PLO going on a near daily basis. So uh, our dealers are experienced in dealing PLO. So if that's your game, this is the place you come and play, especially during the summer. Tremendous. Well, you know, Ryan, uh, at the poker table, it's always good to change gears once in a while. So here's a curveball for you. We took a long look at your Twitter timeline and discovered that you live next door, or at least you did, to a rather unique neighbor. So just wanted to catch up on whether Queen Elizabeth came through for him and if that <laughs> mail order bride deal worked out or not. <laughs> wow, I'm gonna have to go through and scrub my socials. Uh, now that, uh, <laughs> Uh, got people. I've I, that was back when I might have had 14 followers, Robbie. You know, that somehow I've accelerated into the 560 range, whatever it is. I don't keep track, I think it's 560, 566 as of today. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that is a you just you can't you can you can pick your friends, you can't pick your family, and you can't pick your neighbors, huh? Uh -huh. Yeah. I don't know that. Uh, well, you know, the queen is no longer with us, so that gives you right. the pre gives you the dating on when that tweet may have been uh, then, put out. Uh, for, those, for those who didn't see the tweet, can you mention to whom uh, we're, we're referring? I have a neighbor who lives above me who uh, um, is still there, uh -huh. uh, but he's got some very odd uh, business ventures and things that he's involved in, and he. <laughs> Every time he sees me, he makes sure to uh, to include me. He wants to make sure I'm not missing the boat on a variety of different opportunities. Uh, man, there's so many other things I could have tweeted along the way too. But he's he's had some <laughs> other, uh, you know, opportunities. I guess we should say for me to have made a lot of money. I wouldn't have even needed to to be here today in in this position. <laughs> maybe if I had. Taking them up on the offers. Oh goodness! Well, well, that's what uh, we're enjoying ourselves. I got to give a shout out to my buddy Paul uh, Seaton who found that wonderful nugget. Thank you very much, Paul. It's good to keep things light and, and jovial. Um, Ryan, you are a big Saint Seattle Seahawks fan, you know, as you said from Washington State. So we're going to ask you to choose between several celebrities who support the same side as you, but you can only pick one from each pair, and you have to tell us why. Chris Pratt or Phil or Will Ferrell? You gotta go Chris Pratt. Yeah, I like, uh, he's in uh, one of my favorite shows of all time. So he's in Parks and Rec. And uh, funny guy, big Seattle guy. So yeah, definitely, definitely Chris Pratt. Brie Larson or Ar Ariana Grande? Am I? Uh, There's no wrong answer, right? <laughs> I don't, I mean... I guess Ariana Grande. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and well, our final pairing, Macklemore or Snoop Dogg? Well, Snoop is not a Seattle fan. Well put. Just testing you there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, come on. Macklemore's been there from, I mean, he's, he's my dude. 
There you go. Okay, so you got the tried and true Seahawks stripes there. Um, what are your own ambitions at this point? You know, obviously you've written risen to the top of the Aria pyramid. Uh, as for for yourself and as a team, is there a focus on more consistency of product or perhaps further growth, further innovation at this time? Um, <clears throat> the thing that I always stress with our team here is um guest service making sure that we're focusing on uh providing and, and providing for our guests and living up to their expectations day in day out uh, i would be be foolish for me to say that we've reached the top of the industry um you know here as a poker room but i think that we've done a very good job of uh you know building this room from the ground up um, I missed out on the first year or two of this room uh, being here, but I know that there were a lot of really lean days while uh, the management team that was here uh, was trying to, to find its place in this, uh, in this poker world. And so I take the, the, the responsibility of the stewardship of this room really seriously because I know the investment by the people before me, not only the, the original management team, but then, you know, so blessed to work alongside and work for uh, Sean McCormick all these years and the investment that he put into uh, not only our team, but also into me personally. And so, um, you know, we've done a lot of great things here in this poker room over the years. And it's our responsibility to continue uh, the high standards that have been put in place by uh, the groups before us. Um, and the only way that we can continue to do that, in my mind, unless we start building, you know, another 20 tables or something like that, which God, give me the opportunity because we've <laughs> always said here at Aria that our footprint is as big as uh, as many tables as we can get out there. Um, but uh, but no, if, if that's not going to be the case, if we're if we're going to be here with this 24 table room and a studio next door. Um, and we've had the opportunity to maximize that footprint when it comes to business, then the way that we make sure that that business continues to, to choose us every single day is through the guest service that we provide. So it's just so important that our team here enjoy coming to work every day, feel like they're being invested into, um, and then having that energy uh, emanate from them towards our guests so that when our guests and our players show up, um, that they sense that... Uh, they're not an inconvenience, that they're not a burden, that we want them to be here, that we're excited that they showed up, that they called in, put their name on the list uh, and drove in to play poker uh, or just happened to walk by and see, man, you know, that was one of the things, uh, especially during uh, all the COVID years when the, the casino wasn't uh, as busy as it would normally be. The one place that was consistent was walking by this poker room and just seeing a ton of people, plexiglass, masks, and doing all of that that we needed to to make sure uh, from our safety perspective. But so many people that would stop by and just say, "Man, they're so you know, this is great. This people yeah. love being here. People love to be here." And you and you know, you guys, you you and I know. Um, how much we love poker for what it is, which is a social game at heart. And it's so yeah. important that people uh, realize that, that they're coming out here to play poker so that they can visit with their friends, get to meet new friends. Yeah, we win, win a little money, lose a little money. We're trying to take each other's money, but there are, uh, there is that big social aspect um, with poker that, uh, that we want to make sure people are enjoying themselves when they come here. For sure. And, you know, there's just uh, one more question from me before we move into the community questions. But before I ask it, I do have to give that shout out. You talk about friendly, you talk, and you, you know, you paid tribute to Sean McCormick, to uh, Paul Campbell working. What I want to say also, just, you know, having known you, having known those guys, you know, folks, when I ran my Mixed Game Festival, the three of them came not because anyone asked them to, but they came together as a group of friends, not just co-workers and colleagues. I think that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful culture to have developed. And as you said, you know, you don't just sort of fall into poker when you have that shared love for something. And when you work together that it's only natural to form a bond. I think it's a very beautiful thing. Uh, I just wanted to you know, shout out to all three of you guys. It's uh, it's really amazing to see. Um, Ryan, live poker seems to kind of be in a boom phase 
right now. And it's pretty damn awesome to be a part of. Uh, you're in a great spot along for the ride. You've been with Aria for 11 years. Let's look uh, 11 years in the future. Where do you see your career? Where would you like to see uh, your career continuing to blossom? Well, I mean, I, who knows what the future holds? I mean, I look back 10 years, 11 years when I first got the, the job here at Aria. And I remember sitting in a <clears throat> meeting with my director at the time and, and him asking me where I wanted my career to go and, and what I thought I could be. And I famously told him, well, I'm excited about this job. I love that you hired me and I'm, I'm happy to be here. One thing I know for sure that I could never do uh, is be the director of poker operations at all. Ah. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it, it sounds cliche to tell it, but it's the truth. That's exactly what I said. I said, I know I can never be the director. Maybe I could be a manager at one point. But, you know, in that moment, it was true, too, because I just I wasn't prepared for it yet. I wasn't right. there. Yet. And so as you invest in yourself and you, and you work through those opportunities, um, you realize, OK, maybe back then I wasn't. But as I go through it, um, the investment put into me by other people have gotten me to where I am now. So I don't know what the future holds. I would hate to sit here and say, Hey, well, one thing I know for sure is I can't do that because we've already proven that, uh, that, that, that might not be true, but um, <laughs> I hope to still have uh, a voice here in the poker industry. I love poker. I don't play it as much as I used to, um, but I still do love uh, it as a game. It's yeah. a great opportunity for people, especially people who come from competitive backgrounds, maybe athletically, uh, chess, a uh, whole variety of card games and board games. I loved playing everything when I when I was growing up as a kid. I was the kid who would set up the whole board game and beg my parents to play with me. Just yeah. please just sit down and start playing. I mean, I love games. So um, I hope I get the opportunity to... Uh, be involved in uh, this game wherever the industry continues to move forward in, in whatever capacity they'll have me. Brilliant. Lovely. And I got to say, you know, we had, we had said this is, you know, your first poker podcast, not necessarily in front of the cameras, but dang, man, you know, when you're passionate about this to the extent you are extremely well-spoken, obviously, uh, you know, about your love for the game and, and your, all the work that you've done about Aria, it's, uh, you know, it, as far as I'm concerned, as far as like the, the job that you're doing, like putting Ari on the map, putting yourself on the map, I think it's uh, 110. It's fantastic. Good for you, uh, Ryan. Uh, we it's, all have, that, uh, it's all that political training. <laughs> they, well, maybe they're among our listeners, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Uh, we now move into the segment of the show. We turn to you guys, our Cards Chat community, to see what questions you wanted to ask our guests. We have a dedicated thread on the Cards Chat forums for this, so as we announce who our future guests will be, please be sure to send in your questions. I like this first one from Zoro222, Zoro222, uh, wants to know, Ryan, does Aria ever spread any mixed games like Badugi, Courchevel, Du7? So we have, uh, we do, yes, uh, we, and we do at all limits. Um, we occasionally will get uh, the higher limit games, 300, 600, 400, 800. We also do some of the 5,000, 10,000 uh, mixed games. But when it comes to games that I can afford, uh, <laughs> games like 612 and, and going up to like 2040, uh, yes, we're always happy to spread those games. I truly am a mixed game player at heart. Um, I would love to the opportunity to spread more and more. We do run into some space issues from time to time um, with the, with the, some of our core games and with our limited footprint and especially on busy weekends. And so I understand how it works and, and, you know, you got to go where there's space to play in some of the games. And sometimes we don't always have the space, but absolutely. I, I love when we have an opportunity to spread uh, like a six twelve mix here or nine eighteen. Um, because not, not only do we get those players here, but it gives our dealers an opportunity to deal those games, um, and, and help hone their skills as well. Excellent. Very cool. Uh, Chica Bonita. Oh, wow. I like this question. Thank you very much, Chica Bonita. Um, so this is obviously not a, a spot to be critical, but rather from your experience uh, at ARIA for over a decade, what do <clears> you think needs to be added or improved in other poker rooms? in the city, in the country, in the world, to make people feel more comfortable? 
Well, and this isn't meant, this isn't a, a criticism of any other poker room. If sure. anything, I can add our our room into it as well. Um, there, going years and years back, especially when I first got into the industry, I think that there was this kind of sense that poker players in general can be really difficult guests. Um, that they can be uh, maybe demanding and whatnot, and <clears throat> it was almost kind of seen as expected that the staff would kind of buy into that and then treat them as such. And mm -hmm. I think that as the industry has moved forward, we've seen such a great uh, focus on guest experience and guest service mm -hmm. and making sure that every player that shows up to a poker room is welcome. Um, yeah, we've got, you know, every industry has, uh, you know, difficult characters that they've got to uh, work around. But for the most part, um, I've loved over the years to see this culture shift in how we treat our players and guests when they show up into the to the various poker rooms. It's it's very welcoming. It's very inviting. It's very inclusive. Um, and we've just been uh, doing a much better job over the years of <clears throat> breaking down a lot of the barriers uh, that people might have to poker. It's it's an intimidating game to sit down and play. And I think that as the years have gone by, a lot of the rooms, a lot of our competitors, a lot of the rooms that I've been in have done a great job of making sure that all um, all of our players feel welcome showing up to a poker room, especially for the first time. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's a brilliant answer. I love it. And I agree with it as well. I think it's uh, pretty awesome to hear uh, from your perspective, too. Uh, we're going to pull a fast one on you, Ryan. And by that, <laughs> I mean fast one is the community member who has the next couple questions for you. Um, I suppose, says Fast One, that dealing with poker players who've perhaps uh, imbibed a little bit too much alcohol uh, <laughs> is not necessarily an easy task. Obviously not, you know, embarrassing anyone here, but is there any particular story uh, that you remember and, and kind of have to chuckle as to something funny that happened when, you know, those types of, of, of incidents uh, happen. It's kind of like memorable to you in your years at Aria. For sure. I mean, um, <clears throat> obviously we, uh, we're in a place of entertainment uh, and free drinks are being uh, given out by our, our great cocktail servers here. And from time to time, someone, uh, you know, maybe uh, gets up to the point where they've been drinking uh, probably more than they should have. And mm -hmm. so, um, we, uh, we, of course, saying that we do a great job of making sure that people don't have too much and, and we, uh, handle all of that the way we should. Um, but I think, uh, with, uh, particularly with players like this, you really have to gauge the, the energy that they have, you know, people, people that drink, sometimes people, uh, they get angry, they get happy, they get sleepy. I'm this more of the sleepy if I am drinking or whatnot. So you kind of got to gauge the energy and then, uh, you know, adjust from there. I want to, I remember, uh, having a, a particular incident with a player where, um, you know, the dealers have been saying, yeah, he's really falling asleep at the table and having a hard time. And so we had, you know, asked him to call it a night. Um, and I think in a lot of spots that interaction can come across as, judgmental or, or critical or harsh as opposed to just helping someone out. And so I remember helping, you know, get all the chips racked up and then having this, uh, this gentleman uh, basically walking arm in arm with me as I was assisting <laughs> uh, him getting to cash out his chips and, and helping him to find a, a taxi cab. So, um, you know, it was very nice, very friendly, uh, very tired, but making sure that, uh, you know, no, no judgment, no criticism, sure. but helping people with, uh, with whatever help they might need there. I like it. Very, very good. One more from, from fast one procedural. I like this question because, you know, it's, it's rare that I get a question that I have absolutely no clue what the answer is. How long does a deck of cards get used before it's time to be replaced by a new one? <clears throat> so we don't have any set guidelines on that here, which is great. It gives us, uh, you know, we're not, uh, we're able to use the product all the way up until we feel like the the, the lifespan has ended on it and we'll, re you know, replace. One particular procedure that we have always kind of followed here at Aria that gives us a fresh rotation of cards and setups into the, um, into the room is 
we always provide our uh, table one games with a fresh setup when they start. Okay. So okay. then we take those uh, lightly used cards and continue to move them throughout the room so that we are, are rotating through our cards pretty, uh, pretty regularly. Um, obviously, any cards that get brought to our attention from players or from dealers, uh, anything that's indented, anything that's discolored, we would remove from play. Sure. But we don't have any set uh, guidelines on when we go around um, and uh, and remove decks from play. It's basically based off the feedback we get from the players and the dealers. Okay, interesting. I, I, I was just completely <laughs> clueless if there's procedures about that sort of thing. Um, Luvart, thank you very much for submitting this question. Um, you know, Aria, I'll, I'll preface it. I know when we spoke you know, before we uh, got on the call uh, that Aria has been kind of like on the cutting edge of uh, promotion as far as uh, digital and live streaming, that kind of stuff. LeVart wants to know, Ryan, what is your preferred method uh, of promoting a poker room? Is it social media, maybe some big event or tournament series, a collaboration uh, with a famous poker player? What do you sort of enjoy the most and, and perhaps thinks, you know, think uh, works best? All of the above, obviously, you know, I, I, I get so excited about um, the great promotion opportunities uh, that come through social media. Um, word of mouth is a big one. You know, people people play poker where the games are. Mm -hmm. And so as you begin to get that reputation as being a place where the games are, that's where people want to naturally gravitate to. And, and that's why we see in the industry, it can be very difficult for new rooms to kind of get a foothold, even if they're beautiful rooms, great management staff, great dealing team, all of those things. Um, it's difficult at times to start carving out a footprint. And so uh, that word of mouth is, is a big one. Um, but look, nowadays, it's so much different than it was when I first came into the industry. Hmm. If, if you had said the word mug to me 20 years ago, I would have <laughs> thought you were talking about coffee or, or something that might happen out in a shady parking lot. Um, <laughs> but now meetup games are a definite a way to get uh, people interested in and eyeballs put onto the game of poker and wanting to see some of the the, the great streamers and vloggers that we've had in the industry, um, you know, being able to come out and visit with them. And so that is definitely a, a great way of promotion. Um, our digital signage here in the room that we have uh, created and making sure that we're getting information out for the types of events that we are, are running over at the studio or events that we're running here in the room ourselves. Uh, letting people know all of our different offerings. There's just so many things. Social media. We're we're still, um, you know, this is the humble brag, and I don't get all the credit for it. I actually just walked into it, but we are we have the largest Twitter following of any brick and mortar casino or poker room, excuse me, um, on on Twitter. So we're very uh, excited about that. I have to give all the credit to Sean McCormick on that. He's the one who really invested into that and making sure that we had a presence uh, in a space that the poker industry really operates in. And so making yeah. sure that we continue to have a voice in the, in the Twitter sphere um, is really important to us. And that's really helped us in our promotional efforts as well. So really an all, you know, all in one approach, uh, uh, the, the utility knife of, of sorts, Swiss Army knife uh, of getting people to uh, know what we're about and wanting to experience it for themselves. Sure. And that uh, handle is at Aria Poker, right? Correct. Right. Okay. Very cool. So follow it, folks, if you aren't already. Uh, two more question askers. Uh, one new name I haven't seen before, at least I don't think I have. Uh, Balloon 1982. Thank you so much for sending this one in. Uh, great, like, sort of like a follow up question. I don't know. Obviously, you couldn't have known, but Ryan, you had said, uh, that, you know, PLO, it's the place, uh, you know, at Aria Poker. Uh, Baloo does want to know what kind of Omaha poker is most popular at Aria? Is it like a big O, a PLO, PLO 8? Which, which one? <clears throat> it's just going to be PLO high for the most part. Um, we've spread uh, big O. We're not opposed to spreading big O. Uh, PLO 8 or better. Um, but typically those games would be in a mix when it comes to the, the core games that we offer, the one, two PLO, the five, five PLO, and even the quarter, 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 50 PLO games, uh, they're just going to be straight PLO high. Uh, cool. so that seems to be the one that, uh, that is the most popular and the one we spread the most. 
Cool. Very good. Uh, our final question comes to us from Crystals, our good friend. Thanks so much, Crystals, for sending this one in. Uh, kind of a gimme, a good uh, way to sort of end off. Uh, you know, we're now at uh, the beginning of May. Obviously, uh, summer's coming with WSOP. Uh, why don't you let us know sort of what Aria is doing to, to bring players in? What do you guys have sort of going on the rest of this month in May as well as uh, over the summer? Great question. I mean, May is uh, May is our lead up month. May is our let's get all of our ducks in a row. Uh, this is our opportunity to uh, bring on all of the staff that we need for the summer months. Uh, we're going to be running our Aria Poker Classic as we always do, uh, highlighted by our BetMGM Championship event, two million dollar guarantee, thirty five hundred dollar uh, buy in. That's going to be the first uh, major weekend. So the ninth. Uh, 9th and 10th of uh, June. Um, so we're really excited about that. There's going to be plenty of opportunities for qualifiers and satellites. That NGM is going to be uh, sending a minimum of 100 online qualifiers. Nice. Um, so we're really excited about the cross-promotional efforts. We even have the Borgata uh, sending uh, uh, package winners. They're running their own satellites over there and and sending people out to Vegas. We're doing things here locally at MGM Grand and, and uh, Bellagio, Mandalay Bay, our footprint here in Vegas as well. So um, we're doing all of those things in anticipation of our ARIA Classic. But leading up into May, we really focus on training our dealers, get, making sure that we have enough dealing staff, um, getting enough support staff with floor supervisors and game attendants so that the experience our players have here during the summer is uh, seamless. Um, but we want to make sure that the that the temporary dealing staff that we have is well trained as well. We don't uh, we don't just make them only deal tournaments. They get to deal all of the games in the room. So uh, we had some great feedback after last year from our player base and especially from the dealers themselves who were really happy about the investment in them, making sure that their first time dealing at the Aria Poker Room isn't on table one to Phil Ivy and and those guys where they're really going to be nervous that they get some table time in a a non-confrontational setting where it's very easy and they're learning. Maybe, maybe I'm the most critical person at the table as the director, and that's a good thing. So we're, we're getting to invest in them that way. So that gets them prepared for the work that they're going to be doing during the summer. So good fa player feedback on that. Great feedback from the, uh, the dealers who went through, through the course last year. So we're excited about that. And then of course the summer uh, just, it's going to be another great summer here in Las Vegas for poker as it always is. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to step foot uh, in the Aria poker room once again, as well, avail myself of some of the games. If I can find the time, uh, the commitment, as you mentioned, um, folks, thank you all for sending in questions to Ryan Kirk. And again, a friendly reminder to all of you out there in the cards chat community. We'd love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guests in the dedicated thread on the forums. Guys, please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes and spread the word via your social media channels if you like the show. Ryan, this has been an absolute pleasure for me. I hope you've enjoyed it. Is there anything else uh, you'd like to share with the Card Chat audience before we let you go? Just really appreciate the opportunity to come on and speak with you and, and to speak to the audience. It's been a, a great uh, uh, time for me to talk about Aria Poker and the things that we're doing, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Ryan. Uh, thank you all for tuning tuning in once again to another episode of the Cards Chat Podcast. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town from the world's number one poker community.